My name is Art McMorris. I'm the Peregrine Falcon Coordinator with the Pennsylvania Game Commission. And we're here today to ban three young Peregrine Falcon chicks here uh, on the 15th floor of the Rachel Carson State Office Building in, in Harrisburg. Uh, this uh, nest is uh, managed in cooperation between the Pennsylvania Game Commission and the Department of Environmental Protection. So the reason that we're doing this is we're helping the peregrine falcon population to recover. Uh, peregrine falcons, as most of you probably know, were completely wiped out, really in North America, east of the Rockies, and south of the Arctic, by DDT and other pesticides in the 1940s and 1950s. So by the 1960s, they were completely gone. This is the fastest animal on Earth. In a power dive, they can reach 200 miles an hour or even higher, and they were completely gone. So since that time, the Pennsylvania Game Commission and a number of other agencies in uh, the United States and Canada partnered to breed peregrine falcons in captivity and release them into the wild. And that's the only reason we have peregrine falcons uh, today. Uh, the, the population in Pennsylvania is still recovering. The recovery is going well, but we're not home free yet. So everything we're doing here is to help the population recover. So what I'm going to be doing here is, first of all, uh, verifying uh, the nest results. And we can also, we call this the banding visit because we, we will be putting bands on their legs. These have coded numbers on them so that when any of these birds is seen in the future, we'll know how old it is, we'll know that it has survived to that point, we'll know its age, we'll know where it came from. If it's nesting somewhere, we'll know it's nesting, we'll know its productivity. This is one of our most important tools for tracking the peregrine fal falcon population uh, as it recovers. Okay, so just by visually looking at the birds, I think we have two girls and a boy. The female falcons uh, are larger than the males, and that's true uh, with most falcons and owls and hawks. And these birds are 18 to 19 days old. We know that from the nest cam. I'm just gonna take a quick look at their weights. At this age, 18 to 19 days, then the males should be in the high 500s or around 600 grams, and the females should be more like 700 grams. So, this is just a quick check on their weights. And, bingo. What did I say, two, girls, uh, uh, two boys and a girl? That's exactly what we have. So let's start with a young female. And I'm gonna check her weight with this spring scale, which is already adjusted for the weight of the holding bag. And she is 715 grams, 715. That's exactly what she should be at day 18 to 19. Now, since these birds are growing, obviously, we have to know how old they are in order to know what, they should, uh, uh, what weight is appropriate for a male or a female. So uh, the weight doesn't tell us what sex they are unless we know about how old they are. And another way that we can tell their age if we don't have a camera, which is true of most of the nests, is by their plumage. Okay, by day 20, we should see a dark line at the tips of the primaries on the relaxed bird. We don't see that. Okay, just by the plumage, I can tell she's about 18 to 19 days old. And another way that we tell is by measuring the tail feathers. Between day 13 and 21, these tail feathers emerge from their sheaths at about two millimeters a day. So I'm going to measure this, and this one here is 10 millimeters. Okay, so that would mean she is 18 days old. So 715 grams for an 18 day old, that tells us it's a female. And there's one other thing I'm going to do. Look at the legs, and look at how thick that is. That's called the tarsus. When, you look at the, when we have the males, you'll see that that tarsus is smaller than that. 
not only are the females larger, but their feet and their tarsus is bigger in proportion to their body, and that allows them to take bigger prey than the males. I have a leg gauge here, which I can use to measure the size of the tarsus, and it will probably fit into a six. Yes, it does, but that's snug. Six is the size we use for males. She gets a size 7A band because she's a female. Okay? Before we ban, then, so thank you, Heather, for writing all these things down. Now, for health checks, the most important thing that we do is look in the throat for evidence of trichomoniasis. And Scott, if I can have you hold the bird so she can claw you instead of me. Well, she, she merely bites me. And I'm looking for evidence of trichomoniasis, which is a protozoal infection that is almost always fatal if they get it at this age, and I see nothing. Okay, the mouth is nice and clean and pink. That's what it should be. If I saw evidence for trick, I have some antibiotic that I could treat her with. Her eyes also look good. I'm going to check her ears for evidence of parasites. Birds have no external ear uh, ears like we do. They have an ear opening, and sometimes flies will lay, lay their eggs in, in there, and that's pretty disgusting. But I see no evidence of that. Okay? Can you see that lump there? She has had a couple of healthy breakfasts and maybe a lunch. That is her bulging crop. That's like a sack in her esophagus where they store food before it goes down uh, to their stomach. I'm going to check now for, for lice and mites and blood-sucking flies. And I do see a few. Okay, In the wild, they would have no recourse. They just have to suffer. Sometimes those infestations can be so bad that they really harm the health of the chick. So I have some powder that we'll use as the last thing that we do. Uh, to kill those. The feet I've already looked at. The feet are good. Her keel is good. I'm feeling for development of the flight muscles, but I already know that the, the muscles are developing well because her weight is, is correct for the age. So that's everything we need to know. Uh, you've written down all of that, including the tail length? Yes. Okay. So now we will band her. As I said, these bands will allow us to track this bird in the future if she is found anywhere. Okay, this first band is going on the right leg. This is a U.S. Fish and Wildlife band. It's a number series that's used throughout the U.S. and Canada. That's what the band looks like. And if you can read that number, you're better than I am. You can only read that number if the bird is in your hands, which means that it's been found injured or dead somewhere. But if it is found injured and dead, then we can, from that band number, identify the bird. And I'll tell you a little bit more about that in just a minute. This is what we call a lock-on band. These birds are so strong that if we didn't have this lock-on tab, they could pry that right off. Just like a kid who gets a cut, you put on a band-aid and they play with a band-aid and take it off. People often ask me, does the band hurt the bird? Does it bother the bird? Well, not any more than my watch and my ring hurt me or bother me. It's just a piece of jewelry for them. So now, because you can't read that band unless you have the bird in your hands, I'm putting on another band on the left leg with large characters, which can be read on a free living bird if you see it with binoculars or in a good photograph. And that's going on the left leg. That one fastens with rivets.
Now she's screaming bloody murder. We're not hurting this bird, but that's their alarm call. She just doesn't know what's going on. And so she's just letting mom and dad know and her nest mates know, hey, something's going on. I don't know what it is, but just to be safe, take cover. But we're not doing anything that hurts the birds. That's just naturally what they do. Now, when these birds fledge, when they take their first flight, they're not very good at flying. I think, of, I think of them as being sort of like kids learning to ride a bicycle. You know, they fall a lot, they're kind of wobbly, and these birds are the same. And as a result, here in downtown Harrisburg, they often end up taking a first flight where they just kind of fail. They can't land where they want to. They can't maintain their altitude. So they end up in the street or something like that which is not good, obviously. So here DEP has organized a fledge watch, a group of people who run out, and uh, if a fledgling ends up in the street or something, they stop traffic, they run out, they pick up the bird, and they take it back to a safe place. And last year, there were three youngsters. All three of them were rescued. One of them was rescued twice and one of them that re was rescued once and taken to someplace safe ended up flying into a window later on and dying. So these are hazards of the urban environment. Yeah, I'm gonna put a little bit more on. Those are hazards of the urban environment that the birds don't face at natural cliffs, which is why we're, we really like to see more of these birds nesting at cliffs. All of the birds face other hazards. They face hazards of predators, of not learning to hunt well enough, of, of bad weather, etc. But those in the cities also face the hazards of glass or landing in the street or something like that. And that red tape is just so that the fledge watchers can identify her without even having to read the other band. They can say, oh, red's in trouble. Go pick up red. Okay, the last thing I'm going to do now is dust her with this. This is flea and tick powder from a, um, from a pet store. It's pyrethrins, which are uh, actually isolated from chrysanthemums. Um, and uh, it's uh, very effective in killing these lice that suck blood, parasitic flies that suck blood, and mites that actually eat the feathers of the bird. It's very effective in getting rid of those. And it's harmless to the birds, it's harmless to us. We could eat this if we wanted to. I don't particularly want to. Okay, and she is done. Is there anything I've forgotten? Nope, that's it. Okay, in you go. Thank you.